So on the 6th of December, Jacob is well enough to make a trip to Charleston. On January 7th, it's mentioned in a letter that Jacob has just passed through Santee on his way back to Mount Joseph, only he never got to Mount Joseph. So somewhere along the way, we have no idea what happened to him, um, he died. And we don't know when Rebecca found out that her husband was dead. But by the time she did, she'd already suffered another loss. You are listening to History Man, the platform for historians, curators, and authors to tell their stories of the American Revolution, walk in the footsteps of heroes, and proclaim freedom reigns. On today's episode, we are so very fortunate and happy to have Margaret Peggy Pickett, an independent researcher, author, and living history presenter. And her book, Rebecca Bruton Mott, American Patriot and Successful Rice Planner. So welcome, Margaret. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Margaret, and uh, as we prepared for this episode, I'm blown away by the research that you've done uh, in preparation for these books. And before we get into that, where can our listeners find your books? They're on Amazon um, and Barnes & Noble. McFarlane Press is the one uh, that's the publisher for my book on Eliza Lucas Pinckney, and um, Evening Post Books published the book about Rebecca Mott, so they can be purchased from them also. So I think when people read the books, they're gonna it's gonna open their eyes to not only those individuals but to the time that they lived in. And it, it may clarify a lot of the questions they have in the back of their mind. I know it has for me so far. So tell us a little bit about Rebecca Mott. A Rebecca was born on June 15th, 1737. She was the fourth of five children born to Robert Bruton and his second wife, Mary Griffith Lawton Bruton. Sadly, only uh, three of Mary and Robert's five children survived to adulthood, their son Miles Bruton and their daughters Frances and Rebecca. Uh, the Brutons were a prominent, a wealthy family in Charleston. Uh, Rebecca's grandfather and father were prosperous merchants and leaders in the community. The Brutons had been in South Carolina for three generations and they had prospered there. And during that time, they developed a deep attachment to South Carolina. And they felt an obligation to serve and support it. In the 18th century, it was thought that the wealthy, wealthy men, had an obligation to serve. Now, not all wealthy men felt that way, but the Brutons did. And loyalty, duty, and service to country were highly stressed in the Bruton household. And the country the Brutons felt they owed loyalty, duty, and service to was South Carolina. Now, they considered themselves loyal British subjects, but they were South Carolinians first. And Rebecca grew up in this atmosphere, and she too developed a deep sense of loyalty to her country, to South Carolina. And she had just as much desire to serve and uh, support it as the male members of her family, but of course, being a female, her opportunities to do so were very limited. Right. She was um, a very, as an adult, she was very petite. She was lively, energetic. She was known for her conversational skills, and she was known as a gracious hostess. She was also known as a very kind and caring person. She was always ready to assist anyone in need. Four days before her 21st birthday, Rebecca achieved her main goal in life. What was that? Marriage. Oh, okay. <laughs> the main goal for most 18th century women. So on June 11th, 1758, Rebecca Bruton married Jacob Mott Jr. The Motts were also um, merchant bankers, just like the Brutons. They were also very uh, prominent in the government. Jacob's father was the treasurer of the colony. They had a house in town, and they had a country estate called Fairfield, which was a rice plantation on the south banks of the Santee River, about 45 miles north of Charleston. And like most 18th century elites, they spent the summer and spring months in Charleston, 
and the rest of the year in the country. Rebecca and Jacob would have children together. Only three daughters lived to adulthood. Now, Rebecca and Jacob were firmly rooted in the low country. They were part of that low country elite. But Rebecca did have a connection to the Midlands. Her brother was Miles Bruton, one of the, um, reportedly one of the wealthiest men in South Carolina. And in August of 1775, Miles and his wife and his children boarded a ship bound for Philadelphia. The ship was never seen or heard from again. And in his will, Miles had stipulated that if his sons were to die without issue, his estate was to be divided evenly between his two sisters, Rebecca Bruton Mott and Frances Bruton Pinckney. So among the properties that the two sisters now shared was their brother's very beautiful home on King Street. They decided that one of them ought to live in the house and how they made that decision is not known, but Rebecca and her and Jacob and their three daughters moved into the Miles Bruton house. Now also the sisters inherited several plantations from their brother and they decided that each one of them wanted to have one plantation that belonged entirely to them. So at that time they were, they both owned each one of them. Exactly. Okay. All right. So in September of 1777, Rebecca signed over her half of Greenwich Plantation to Francis. Now where is that? That's uh, in the Congarees okay. in the Midlands. Okay. And Francis signed over her half of Mount Joseph Plantation, also in the Congarees, to Rebecca. Okay. So now Rebecca is the owner of a 1,300-acre plantation on the south side of the Congaree River. In the 18th century, married women could own property in their own right, but because they had no legal identity, their husbands had to act as custodians of it. But the property could not be sold without their permission. Now, while Francis and Rebecca were busy settling their brother's estate, there was a war going on, the War for Independence, the American Revolution. And for the first two years, as you well know, most of the fighting was confined to the North. But in 1778, the war came to the South. And in 1779, the British uh, gained control of all of Georgia. And then they turned their attention to South Carolina. By March of 1780, they had reached the south bank of the Ashley River, and they were beginning to, lay, to prepare to lay siege to Charleston. So at this point, most of the people in town decided it would be wise to evacuate and seek refuge in the countryside, and so the Mots were no exception. But when they left for um, Fairfield this spring of 1780, they took with them not only their immediate family, but... Um, some of their female relations. So the group that gathered at Fairfield included Jacob and Rebecca, their three daughters, 16-year-old Frances, or Fanny, 12-year-old Mary, two-year-old Becky, their married daughter, Betsy Mott Pinckney, who was expecting a child in the summer, Jacob's sister, Martha Mott Dart, and her children, and Polly Bruton, who was Rebecca's niece by marriage. Well, you had uh, spoken earlier before our podcast that there were some historians that differed on those accounts. Is that correct? That they, some of them said that they were living in, this, in the uh, attic of the house in Charleston during the siege. Yeah, the, the story is that um, Rebecca and her daughters were in Charleston during the siege and that when Clinton rode into town after the surrender uh, and took up residence at the Miles Bruton house, um, that Rebecca hid her daughters in the attic so they would not be um, have to associate with the British officers. So why do you think they're at Fairfield? There's a letter from Tom Pinckney, who uh, during the siege was um, stationed on Sullivan's Island, and he was in 
constant contact with his sister at Hampton Plantation, which is only three miles from Fairfield, and of course with his wife, who was at Fairfield. And in one of his letters, he said to uh, Harriet, the enclosed letters for Mr. Mott and Mrs. Neal just came to my hand this morning. Please explain the circumstances to them. So someone had sent Tom a letter for Mrs. Neal, one of their neighbors in Santee, and Mr. Mott, so that Tom could include them with his correspondence um, when he sent his manservant off to uh, Hampton and Fairfield with letters. So that proves that the Mots were not in Charleston okay. for the siege. So you had all these people at the Fairfield Plantation. Now, you described just the family members. Did they bring more people with them also? Did they overwhelm them with servants and slaves? And there would them? probably have been some enslaved servants. Certainly, uh, Mrs. Dart would have, would have someone you know, for the children, okay. uh, a nanny of some kind, right. and their personal servants. Yeah, so there would have been extra enslaved servants at Fairfield too, but in quite quite a houseful. Quite a houseful to yeah. feed and yes. to keep keep uh, occupied and clothed mm -hmm. and, and all those things that go along yeah. with domestic life. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. What else, what happened now? Uh, Tom Pinckney joins them. Um, Tom, of course, was a Continental soldier. As I said before, he was stationed on Sullivan's Island. But toward the, um, sometime in May, General Lincoln sent Tom on a special mission. He wanted him to go to Georgetown, where Governor Rutledge was. And Governor Rutledge was there trying to rally troops to come to the relief of Charleston. And so Tom was to tell Governor Rutledge that he needed to send the relief troops as quickly as possible. So by the time Tom got there, delivered his message, and was headed back with the relief force, um, Charleston had surrendered. So he ended up at Fairfield. Right. Now by this time, General Clinton, of course, has written into Charleston, and he's taken up residence in the most beautiful, prestigious house in town. So he moves into the Miles Bruton house, and while he's pleased with the fact that he's captured Charleston, he knows that's not enough. He needs to bring the rest of South Carolina under British control. So he sent his second-in-command, General Lord Cornwallis, out to occupy key positions in the state. So by the 18th of May, Cornwallis and his army have reached the south bank of the Santee River. And while Cornwallis is waiting for all his troops, his supply wagons, his artillery to be transported across the river, he sent Bannister Tarleton and the British Legion on a special mission to Georgetown. Tarleton was ordered to chase away or take prisoner all violent enemies to the British government. And when he got to Georgetown, I'm certain the, joy, the jubilant loyalists there were only too quick to tell him that two potential dangerous enemies to the British government could be found at Fairfield Plantation, Major Thomas Pinckney of the Continental Army and Jacob Mott, who had been a member of the rebel legislature. So the British visited Fairfield at night. They managed to capture Jacob, but Tom Pinckney, according to the story, managed to climb out the window and take refuge in the swamp. So they probably took um, Jacob to Georgetown, where they would have tried every argument they could think of to try to persuade him to change sides, to sign the oath of allegiance to the king and help them establish a loyalist government in the area. Jacob refused to do so. So at some point, the Mots decided that Rebecca and the women and children that were gathered at Fairfield should relocate to the Mount Joseph plantation. Now, why they made this decision is not clear, but it is very possible that the British forced them to go. It would soon be standard British policy to relocate influential patriot leaders who refused to sign the Oath of Allegiance. 
The British felt that if they allowed these influential patriots to remain in their home counties, they would serve as an example and encourage others to defy British rule. Now, Jacob clearly was not going to cooperate with them, and they may have seen him as a threat to their ability to establish a loyalist government and a loyalist, a loyalist militia in that area, so they just wanted him gone. There had to be a compelling reason for this move. Mm -hmm. It's a journey of about 80 to 90 miles from Fairfield Plantation to Mount Joseph, and that's an arduous journey for five women, one of whom was seven months pregnant, at least six children ranging in age from two to 12, any number of enslaved servants and workers, plus everything that Rebecca could load onto barges and wagons, that she, anything that she could take from her plantation, she would have wanted to take with her because whatever she left behind would in all probability be pl plundered by the British. So where did they ship her husband off to? Jacob didn't go with them. That's a good question. They sent him to James Island. So did they go to Mount Joseph at the behest of the British? Or did they make up their own mind to go? I'm not sure. Okay. It, it may have been that they made the decision on their own, or perhaps it was a condition of the British that they would go there. Um, Jacob was held at James Island until the end of the summer. Okay. And it's likely that the reason he was released then was because he was not going to be returning to Fairfield, okay. but rather to Mount Joseph, where an area where he was not known and he had no influence. I got you. I got you. So right. I think they were sort of made the decision, but it was the, uh, a little pressure was applied. I'm going to go down a rabbit hole right here. Okay. James Island. Do we know where at on James Island? that they were held as prisoner, or were they held as prisoner in homes there? What was the deal? I don't know. There no were um, there were other people that were held on John's Island. Right. I know uh, General Richard Richardson was held there. He was a um, um, militia general. I don't know, but that, that was one of the strategies of the British was to remove these people to the island south of Charleston. Okay. So there may have been some place where whether they where they build some place for them, or like you say whether they house them in different homes, I don't know. So Rebecca is making and and the family is making this arduous trip upriver to Mount Joseph, and where is that? Um, it's on the south side of the Congaree River. Okay. It's close to the uh, town of St. Matthews now. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. all right. Uh, I think it's about a mile from McCord's Ferry. Well, how long did it take them to get there? I'm not sure. They were there by the first part of June because Tom Pinckney, who of course now is a major in the Continental Army and there is no Continental Army, he got permission from the British to go into Charleston to meet with his brother, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, who was, of course, a prisoner of war. And he was able to meet with Charles for half an hour in the presence of, 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 of a loyalist. And he told Charles that he was going north to join General Washington until an army was sent back to South Carolina to liberate it from the British. On the 5th of June, he wrote a letter to his mother, Eliza Lucas Pinckney, telling her that um, he had just met with his brother. Right. On the 11th of June, he wrote again to his mother from Camden. And in between the 5th of June and the 11th of June, he visited Betsy at Mount Joseph. So we know that Rebecca and the others were there sometime in the early part of June. Well, there was no house. There was no owner's house. Well, on. Where did they live? So they took up residence in a farmhouse, uh, an empty farmhouse on an adjacent tract of land. So this is inherited land that they got from their brother when he died on a ship somewhere, right? Right. And it's just, that's all it is, is land. Well, there would have been uh, like an overseer's cottage uh, and, you know, housing for the uh, enslaved workers. There were sheds, um, you know, where farm equipment was kept and... No so plantation forth. house, though. But no plantation house. So they had to build the house. So Rebecca decided to build 
a house, and she chose a spot on a bluff standing 250 feet above the Congaree River. Okay. So they're living at the farmhouse. She's having a house built, and their journey was full of hardships. We don't know what they were, but it was in one of the letters, um, Eliza remarks on she was sorry that that their journey was so difficult. So you would think that they could relax once they're at Mount Joseph, but no. The British happened to be encamped one mile away at Belleville Plantation. So they're constantly visiting. They're looking for horses. They're looking for fodder. They're looking for food. And then they are hit with wave after wave of illness, including smallpox. So um, Jacob is able to join them in September They finally release him from James Island. By December, most of the people at uh, Mount Joseph have recovered their health, except for the youngest Mott daughter, little Becky. So on the 6th of December, Jacob is well enough to make a trip to Charleston. On January 7th, it's mentioned in a letter that Jacob has just passed through Santee on his way back to Mount Joseph, only he never got to Mount Joseph. So... Somewhere along the way, we have no idea what happened to him, Um, he died. And we don't know when Rebecca found out that her husband was dead. But by the time she did, she'd already suffered another loss. Her three-year-old daughter, Becky, died at the end of December. What did he die from? No idea. He just disappears. He just disappears from... Did they find his body? Not that I know of. How did she find out he died then? I have no idea. That's wow. one of those mysteries. It's when you one of do those things, for, for, unless it's written down in history and saved from a historical record, yeah. we just don't know. That's we just thing. don't know what happened to him. It, he, there's a memorial to him at St. Philip's Church, but he's not buried there. Wow. So Rebecca's buried there, but he's not. So I, I don't know what happened to him. And someday, somebody is going to find a piece of information someplace that you would never think to look. That, that maybe will tell us what happened to him, but I just don't know. In January, it, it appears that the house that Rebecca had built was finished, and so they were able to move into it. So this is 1781? 1781, January. So this is after this is after Kings Mountain. Is it before Cowpens or after Cowpens? I don't know. Yeah, but it's right around. It's, it's right, right around, around that, that time, that, that yeah. Mm-hmm. Time. And of course, after Calpins, Cornwallis leaves South Carolina, right? And then they have Guilford's Courthouse, and so there's like this little uneasy time in South Carolina. Which way is this thing going to mm-hmm. go? That sort of thing. But they're able to move into that house. Isn't it interesting how you think in terms of these conflicts, and you think in terms of armies? But what you don't think in terms of are life still continues on with all of these other people within the with the environment of this geography, and certainly that's what happened here. Yeah. Uh, the the Pinckney that you were talking about that uh, had joined the Continental Army was he wounded at some point? Tom Pinckney, yes, he was at the Battle of Camden. He got as far as Hillsborough on his way north, and then he heard that General Gates was coming down with an army. And so he waited there, and he offered his services to Gates, who made him one of his uh, aides. So Tom was at the Battle of Camden, and he was um, trying to protect the the withdrawal of Gates and Caswell and a few of the other generals when 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 all of the militia started streaming back, right. and he was shot in the leg, the left leg. Um, a musket ball shattered his leg. So he became a prisoner of war, and the interesting story there is that he was on a wagon, unconscious with all of the other wounded, and a British officer came by, uh, Captain Charles Barrington Mackenzie of the 71st Highlanders, and he recognized Tom. The, The Pinckney brothers had gone to school in England, and they had gone to the best schools in England, and he recognized him. And not only that, that he was a a friend and a schoolmate, Tom had provided some services for Captain Mackenzie's brother, a naval officer, uh, when he was captured by the French, when the French and the uh, Americans were going to uh, 
we take Savannah from the British. And so uh, Captain uh, Mackenzie had Tom taken into town with the British wounded, and he went to um, Tarleton, and he persuaded him to send his regimental surgeon to look after Tom. And it was by the sheerest luck and skill of the British surgeons that Tom kept not only his life but his leg. He did come to Mount Joseph, I believe it was in October, when his leg had healed enough that he could be transported. But he had to be transported in a periaga, a boat, and they had to com- uh, they had to fix the boat so that it would accommodate his bed because he had to travel in that bed because they didn't want anything to jar his leg and and cause it to you know any right. damage to it. Right. But he and uh, I think one of the reasons that Jacob went to um, Charleston in December was to get permission for Tom to go to Charleston where he could be looked after by a doctor because he his health was not improving at, at Mount Joseph. I got you. So, so when they moved into the house in January, mm-hmm. he was not there. He was not there. He and Betsy and the baby. Betsy had her baby in August about the same time as the Battle of Camden. Okay. So the three of them have gone. They're in, in Charleston. They're in Charleston by, I believe it's the 16th of um, January. So who finally moved into that house? All right. It would have been Rebecca and her two daughters by this time. It's Frances and, and uh, Mary, Polly Bruton, and Martha Mott Dart, and all of her children. So they're all there. Mm-hmm. All these women and children are there, 250 feet above the Congaree mm-hmm. River in this new house right. and on this 1,500-acre plantation, and the war is going on around them. Right. Right? And the British arrive. And the British arrive, and and they and they are going back and forth across their property. They're behind the lines, really. Uh, well, what what happens? The British show up on Becca's doorstep, and they say, uh, "We're commandeering your house, and we're going to fortify it and turn it into a supply depot." Wow! Tell us how they can get your book. Okay, um, it's on Amazon. Um, Barnes and Nobles carries it. Um, you can get it from the publisher, from um, Evening Post Books. And the or name any, of the book? It's Rebecca Mott, American Patriot and Successful Rice Planner, seventeen thirty-seven to eighteen fifteen. It's a fabulous book, and uh, I think we got a little more to talk about on that book uh, in the next episode. So okay. Very good.